Welcome to AEI. Today is December 7th, a most appropriate day to welcome the authors of Surprised Again, The COVID Crisis and the New Market Bubble. <laughs> I've read this book cover to cover twice, once in its early stage before it was in print and again in the past week. It's not only an excellent account of the financial crisis that gripped the country as it recognized the severity of the COVID crisis, but a very interesting discussion of the government policies enacted to counter the economic consequences of the pandemic. After the authors discussed their new book, Chris DeMuth, distinguished fellow at the Hudson Institute and I, will react to some of the issues and events Alex and Howard discuss in Surprised Again. Then we'll turn to the audience for questions, uh, including the online audience who can send in their questions. Um, and if my past interactions with these scholars is any guide, I would not be surprised at all if we have a lively discussion. Alex Pollack is a senior fellow of the Mises Institute. Between November 2019 and February 2021, he served as principal deputy director of the Office of Financial Research at the US Treasury. Prior to his government service, he was a senior fellow at R Street, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and the president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago from 1991 to 2004. He has also served as a director of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Group, Ascendium Education Group, and the Great Books Foundation. Alex's work includes the study of financial systems and the re their recurring crisis, the politics of finance, risk, and uncertainty, central ba banking, and housing finance. He's a graduate of Williams College, the University of Chicago, and Princeton University. He's the author of two previous books, Finance and Philosophy, Why We're Always Surprised, and Boom and Bust, Financial Cycles and Human Prosperity. Howard B. Adler is an author, attorney, and former government official. From May 2019 to, through January 2021, he serves as Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for the Financial Stability Oversight Council. He was responsible for monitoring the financial stability of the United States, during the first year of the COVID-19 crisis. He was awarded the Treasury's Distinguished Service Award for his efforts by the Secretary of Treasury. Mr. Adler was a partner for over 30 years at Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher LLP law firm where he served as co-head of both the firm's Corporate Transactional Practice Group and REIT Practice Group. Prior to joining Gibson and Dunn, he served as Executive Vice President of the Riggs National Bank of Washington, DC he has also served as the treasurer of the Washington DC Bar and is on the board of governing trustees of the American Ballet Theater. He's, he's a graduate of John Hopkins University and the New York University School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Alex Pollack. Many thanks to AEI for hosting this event, uh, to Paul for organizing it and for your introduction, to Chris Muth for participating. Uh, our publisher, Paul Dry, is here. Thank you, Paul. And also, Dan Semmelsberger is here. Dan was our research assistant for this book and did all of the graphs, so, uh, which so clarify the various issues throughout the book. Now, Surprise Again has three fundamental elements. Uh, the first is a history of the totally unexpected 2020 financial panic. Uh, then the aftermath of that panic, including its massive financing uh, by government deficits and Federal Reserve money printing, the subsequent asset price boom and the everything bubble, and the emergence of runaway consumer price inflation. All in all, it's a fascinating story for present and, we hope, future students of crises. Uh, the second part is a macro or a philosophical reflection on the nature of fundamental financial uncertainty, which cannot be eliminated. Uh, consider, for example, that there were no less than 30 official systemic risk analyses by all kinds of government agencies here and abroad and uh, many multinational agencies. All of these were published in 2019 trying to say what might be ahead. Well, not one of them got 
2020. Right, not one. Uh, and that's because they were not dealing with risk to make a fundamental distinction here. That is to say, they're not dealing with probabilities which can be calculated, but with uncertainty, uncalculable and ineluctable in the fog of future financial and economic events. The third part of the book is an examination of a number of key financial problems, all still unresolved. In his remarks, uh, <laughs> Howard is going to discuss issues of cryptocurrencies, insolvent multi-employer pension funds, uh, and the utterly failed uh, federal student loan program. Among the other issues we take up are runaway inflation in house prices, now deflating, and the hugely important phenomenon we call central banking to the max. Now, starting with the uh, 2020 financial panic, the uh, COVID health crisis turned into a financial crisis. Although great expert efforts, as we said, had gone into trying to assess systemic risk, in fact, everybody was surprised again. Uh, the constant attempts to foresee the next big crisis failed to see the one that came. And the reason for this was they failed to link the outbreak of a new deadly virus, the possibility or even probability of which was well known to science, that if such a thing happened, it would be linked to a financial collapse and a financial and economic uh, contraction with, mar with the prices in financial markets all dropping like stones. Well, we start the book with a discussion Howard and I had in December of 2019, three months before the crisis began, in which we reviewed all of the issues around the financial system, looking for the next crisis, and agreed we couldn't see one. We couldn't see that crisis coming. At the end of this discussion, however, I said to Howard, nonetheless, when it does come, we won't see it coming. That turned out to be a good forecast. We didn't see it coming, and neither did anybody else. And a key reason why we didn't, and, and neither did anybody else, is that all finance is political finance. And to link the emergence in China of a new virus to international financial disaster required forecasting the intermediate step of political actions. Governments locked down huge sectors of the economy, as we know, and however necessary those actions were, financial actors suddenly had to guess what that meant for growth, employment, cash flows, present values, prices of financial assets, and for defaults on debt, all of which just a little while before had seemed so benign. Everybody feared the unknown. Uh, so in our book, we ask our readers, and we ask all of you this evening, as we wrote, did you, excellent readers, and you, distinguished audience, imagine such a link between the emergence of a virus and a financial panic in 2020? No, you didn't. Did you put even a tiny probability on it as one of your so-called tail risks? No, you didn't. You were, we guess, completely surprised again, along with all the experts. Now, we discuss in detail the numerous travails and fears of that time in Chapter 2, The Panic of 2020. In particular, we discuss how financial actors rediscovered the permanent truth that asset prices are ephemeral. Prices seem very real, but in fact, they're ephemeral. Uh, and they can go down more than you thought possible. They can go up more than you thought possible, too. But the going down part is more painful. Uh, in April of 2020, the Wall Street Journal proclaimed in capital letters that March was the month that changed everything and wrote, March began with a booming economy and ended with giant companies begging for bailouts. 
nice alliteration. Not only giant companies, but everybody else was begging for a government bailout, and the bailouts came. In common with the last crisis, the governments and the central banks, uh, in the words of former Secretary of the Treasury, Paulson, had no choice but to fly by the seat of their pants, making it up as they went along. Uh, and they did indeed make up a lot of things as they went along. Now, Walter Badgett was a uh, seminal financial thinker whose major book appeared in 1873. In 2020, governments applied one part of Walter Badgett's theory of how to deal with a crisis, which is lend freely. Uh, a money printing central bank, in fact, is most handy in a financial crisis. The Federal Reserve was hyperactive. If you look in the book, table 3.4 shows you 14 special financial programs the Federal Reserve introduced in 2020. And the National Treasury can greatly expand its spending to finance a crisis as long as it has a central bank to print money in order to buy its debt. And table 3.1 will show you 22 special U.S. Treasury programs uh, invented by the Treasury in 2020. These were wild and frightening days. But with the passage of time, now that we know how the recovery unfolded and finally was solved, it's already becoming difficult, isn't it, to remember how bad and how frightening it was at the time how intense the uncertainty was, how dizzying was the sense of collapsing market prices, and how opaque the future seemed as financial markets went into free fall with seemingly no bottom. Now we hope the book will help the group memory in the future of what it was like in those frightening days. And they, the, those days certainly included uncertainty, as we said, and that's the second point I want to talk about. <clears throat> we discuss uh, in the book how a highly placed political officer and a top financial CEO both predicted that another crisis, uh, this was after the uh, 2007 to 2009 crisis, both predicted that another crisis would not happen, quote, in our lifetime, unquote. Well, that was a really odd call because the average frequency of financial crises is once about every 10 years on average, and they had plenty of uh, decades left in their lives, and so they were wrong. Uh, interestingly, once every 10 years was the frequency of financial crises in Badgett's time as well as it is in ours. And as Paul Volcker once wittily said, about every 10 years we have the greatest crisis in 50 years. Uh, now, the, uh, the events of 2020 were hardly the first to demonstrate that highly intelligent, highly knowledgeable people in positions of great authority may still be unable to anticipate what crises the future may bring. And John Maynard Keynes in 1937 described the uncertainty very well. Our knowledge of the future, he wrote, is fluctuating, vague, and uncertain about these matters, there is no scientific basis on which to form any calculable probability, whatever. Now note, all financial models run on calculable probabilities. Keynes continued that our expectation of the future being based on so flimsy a foundation is subject to sudden and violent changes. The practice of certainty and security suddenly breaks down New fears and hopes will, without warning, take charge of human conduct. The year 2020 certainly brought such sudden and violent changes, and new fear marked the first half of that year as people were afraid not only for their lives but also for their money at the same time. Now, a key problem with uncertainty, as the book discusses, is that it's always there whether we feel it or not. So a a Fed, Federal Reserve staff study of uncertainty, for example, says this. 
large uncertainty spikes, such as those appearing concurrently with the outbreak of COVID, uh, appear cyclically. But note, that's the uncertainty that somebody has felt or the whole country has felt. But the real uncertainty is always there, whether we feel it or not. Uh, it's there before the panic when no one was worried about it as well as during the panic when everyone was worried about it. And it's there and it may not even be felt by people who are diligently looking for the next crisis. So we can say what the Roman poet Claudian wrote 1600 years ago is still usefully applied to the economic and financial future of today and of all times, to wit, res hominum tanta calignia volvi, that is, human affairs are surrounded by so much fog, and the financial future certainly is that. Uh, and now, late in, 19, in 2022, uh, we know that the air is coming out of the great everything bubble, that the Federal Reserve and other major central banks and the treasuries intentionally inflated. And this experience of the deflation of the bubble is a cost of the bailouts. And the key thesis of our book is nothing is free. And this is indeed in my opinion, the single most important principle in economics. Nothing is free, and the bailout wasn't free either, and we're paying the cost now. Uh, as I said, the book also uh, discusses numerous uh, key financial problems. Uh, as you'll see, if you peruse the table of contents, <clears throat> I have short comments on just two of them. One on mortgages and the mortgage market. In the wake of the COVID crisis, the United States experienced a runaway inflation in house prices, stoked all the way along by the Federal Reserve, which was still buying mortgages and making itself into the biggest savings and loan in the world when the, uh, when the inflation was roaring, uh, an, an amazing and to me inexplicable uh, uh, practice. What we said in the book is, well, if mortgage rates go back to normal, which we said would be 5 or 6%, that would be the end of the house price inflation and house prices would fall. Now mortgages are about 6% at the moment and house prices are falling. How far will they fall? Well, one reputable forecast from AEI, uh, to be precise, is that we'll get a fall of 10 to 15% next year in house prices uh, on a national average basis. Let me just make one uh, comment too on central banking to the max, which was completely unanticipated and astonishing. This, we show uh, in table 12.7 in the book that six major central banks uh, ended the last crisis in 2008 uh, they had three, I'm, I'm sorry, were at the time of the last crisis in 2008, they had $3.8 trillion of assets. By 2021, with this crisis, they multiplied their assets by seven times to $26.7 uh, trillion, and how that will all play out is still unsure, and, and uh, they and we are working on it. Well, what next? In a nice turn of phrase, one financial analyst said this year, we have a thick stew of uncertainties. The editors of the Financial Times said, the staccato of recent events has created astonishing uncertainty. Well, yes, but nothing nearly as astonishing as the COVID panic in the spring of 2020. Uh, and its aftermaths, the bailouts, the amazing boom, the everything bubble, the runaway consumer price inflation, and now the deflation of the bubble. Well, in the book, we have an appendix, which was Paul Dry's great idea. It's called Your Own Update, which when you get to the end of the book, you can take a set of key analytics that we talk about in the book and put in what they were, like the price of Bitcoin and the rate on the 90-day uh, treasury bill, 
and whether or not there's a big war going on and what the assets of the Federal Reserve are. And you can put your own numbers in when you read the book. Uh, we also recommend that on the other side of that page, it's all blank, so you should write down your own summary forecast of what is to come uh, so that in the future you could read what you were thinking then and see how you did. With that, Paul, thank you very much again for having us to talk about our book. Thanks, Alex. Please join me in welcoming Howard Adler to give us the second part of the story. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me express my deepest um, appreciation to AEI for having us here today. Very, very nice of you. AEI is an amazing institution, and it's an honor uh, to be here this evening. In the book, we look at several sectors of the financial system in terms of where they stand after COVID and the government response to COVID. I will focus on three of those sectors, cryptocurrency, multi-employer pension funds, and student loans, emphasizing some key takeaways from the book. Cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency began as a libertarian revolt against government monopolies on money. The intellectual forefather of cryptocurrency is Friedrich Hayek, who wrote in 1976 that people should be free to choose any form of money in which they have confidence. Private money is not new. It has been used throughout history, as early as the Knights Templar during the Crusades. Private banks issued their own currencies in the United States in the early 19th century. <coughs> Cryptocurrency adds the technological innovation of using the blockchain, a distributed ledger technology, to record and store transactions in the cloud without the need for a financial intermediary. In chapter six of the book, we tell the story of Facebook's cryptocurrency, Libra. The story is incredibly instructive in understanding the relationship between governments and cryptocurrency. In June 2019, Facebook announced that it would sponsor Libra, a global cryptocurrency that was a stable coin because it would be backed by a basket of existing currencies and supposedly have a stable price. It would potentially be used by Facebook's over three billion users that's three-eighths of the global population of the world instead of national currencies like the dollar and the euro. Libra would be headquartered and administered in Switzerland, arguably outside the reach of US jurisdiction. This announcement caused great concern and consternation in Washington and governments worldwide. Libra was perceived as a threat to the US dollar and other established currencies. The dollar is the world's reserve currency, which means that foreign currencies, that central banks must keep most of their foreign reserves in dollars in the form of US Treasury debt. This creates demand for such debt and in turn enables the United States to borrow more cheaply, which subsidizes the US economy. In the 1960s, the French described this as an exorbitant privilege, and it is. Um, Treasury and the Fed see the protection of the primacy of the dollar as essential to the U.S. economy and their mission. For this and other reasons, Libra faced great hostility from U.S. and foreign regulators, documented in Chapter 6 of the book, which eventually caused Facebook to abandon the project, essentially. The key takeaway is that governments may simply not allow the creation of a private currency that truly threatens their monopoly over money. Looking at stable coins, uh, in, the, in the interim, other stable coins like Tether proliferated. Uh, they seem to promise immediate redemption into existing currencies, but if you read the fine print, such redemptions were often limited in size and might be at the discretion of the issuer. There was no assurance that reserves actually existed to back stable coins. Cryptocurrency is essentially unregulated in the United States unless it is considered a security in which case the SEC has some jurisdiction. There is not even a requirement for audited financial statements. So investing in cryptocurrency is very risky, as the recent FTX debacle demonstrates, and there have been numerous recent legislative proposals to federally regulate cryptocurrency. Meanwhile, governments have gotten into the crypto biz. More than a majority of central banks worldwide are exploring their own central bank digital currencies, Arguments for CBDCs include making international payments more efficient, 
and providing a way to bank the 1.7 billion unbanked people in the world. China is well down the road to establishing a digital yuan. Its purpose seems to be twofold, to better control its people by making all of their financial transactions visible and subject to control by the Chinese Communist Party, and to challenge the, challenge the dollar's primacy as the currency most often used in international transactions. The latter is a real threat, even though it seems rather crazy for people outside of China to give the Chinese Communist Party control over their money, regimes and individuals subject to US sanctions may trust China and the digital yuan more than the United States and the dollar. China has enormous leverage over a number of developing countries through its Belt and Road program and might try to compel them to use the digital yuan as well. The digital dollar. The Federal Reserve is also considering a CBDC, the digital dollar. There are many downsides to a digital dollar, including significant privacy concerns in making all financial transactions visible to the federal government. It would increase the Fed's power and bloat its already huge balance sheet as massive new deposits are added to its books. To offset these deposits, the Fed would have to invest in assets, which raises the potential for it to invest in politically favored industries and allows it to cut off credit to industries that are out of favor. At its most extreme, a digital dollar has the potential to nationalize the banking system and to make private banks obsolete. It would be hard for private entities to compete with the government, which does not have to show a profit. Despite these problems, Alex and I think that the desire of the Fed to protect the dollar from competitors like the digital yuan would, um, would eventually drive it to recommend a digital dollar to Congress. Worldwide creation of CBDCs would lead to the delicious irony that cryptocurrency, a medium established as a libertarian alternative to government and central bank monopoly over money, could eventually wind up vastly strengthening central banks and create an absolute government monopoly over money, credit, and the financial system. In Chapter 11, we talk about the taxpayer bailout of multi-employer pension plans. And in Chapter 12, we talk about student loans, two troubled financial programs. When we wrote the book, President Biden had not yet proposed a student loan bailout, but we mentioned that possibility. Now that he has implemented it, it struck me that there were some similarities between the two situations that were worth discussing, which I will now do. Both multi-employer plans and student loans were deeply underwater. Both had inherent structural flaws, and both bailouts had similar characteristics. Multi-employer pension plans are a creation of organized labor. They are employee benefit plans maintained under collective bargaining agreements to which more than one employer contributes. The plans are generally found in parts of the country where a number of employees, employers have collective bargaining agreements with a union whose members perform tasks for more than one of the employers. For example, is where members of the Teamsters Union may be involved in shipping groceries to a number of different grocery chains, or where employers too small to have their own plans are too small to have their own plans and so combined. As of 2018, there were 2,472 multi-employer plans with 15.5 million participants and beneficiaries. These plans were vastly underwater to the tune of 757 billion according to the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation's 2020 projections. Many of these plans were projected to, be, to become insolvent in the next 20 years. The PBGC, which was supposed to guarantee these benefits, itself had a $64 billion deficit in the funds supposed to insure these plans. Many of the problems were due to structural issues with the plans themselves. The plans existed in declining industries where employers were going out of business, resulting in fewer employee, employers to share costs. And employees were being laid off, resulting in fewer employees to make contributions to the plan and a higher ratio of those receiving than making payments. The plans are run by boards of trustees with equal representation from labor and management, a perfect recipe for increasing pension obligations but not funding them and making it almost impossible to increase contributions or decrease benefits in bad times. During the 1990s, many of these plans set significant asset growth, but rather than using these assets to preserve current <coughs> benefits over time, they elected to increase benefits, which resulted in further problems when the surplus is, um, dissipated in the following decade. Along came the American Rescue Plan in 2021, 
supposedly a COVID relief measure which bailed out these plans even though their troubles predated and had very little to do with COVID. The act provided the troubled multi-employer plans be paid enough for them to pay all benefits through the end of 2051. In other words, Congress elected to subsidize these plans for 30 years at an estimated cost of 86 billion according to the Congressional Budget Office. There is no cap on the amount of assistance provided by the act. The CBO number is likely to be understated because as the book explains, multi-employer plans have accounting rules that allow them to understate the amounts by which they are underfunded. Regardless of the cost of the bailout, these plans are being set up to fail again because no structural reforms were made. The boards of trustees are still structured dysfunctionally. Benefits are still unlikely to be decreased or contributions increased during bad times. Most taxpayer bailouts in the past have been accompanied by attempts at structural reform. Dodd-Frank is a good example, whatever you think of Dodd-Frank. Here there were no structural reforms. Before the bailout, the PBGC estimated that its multi-employer plan insurance program would be insolvent in 2026, four years from now. After the bailout, it estimated the program would be insolvent in 2055, four years from the end of the bailout. If the Democrats are in power in 2051, look for another taxpayer bailout. The student loan bailout has striking similarities to the multi-employer loan bailout. The student loan market is enormous, with 1.8 trillion in outstanding debt in 2021, of which 1.6 trillion is guaranteed by the federal government. Federally guaranteed loans are a legacy of the Johnson administration. Successful loan programs are supposed to show a profit, but this one never did again because of inherent structural problems. First, under the program, loans could be obtained with little or no credit underwriting. <clears throat> the proceeds of the loans went to universities, which did not have to guarantee any portion of the loans. Fueled by the revenues from these easy credit loans, educational institutions built buildings, raised tuition, and hired armies of administrators, the cost of which was paid by an ever-increasing amount of student loans. Universities had no incentives to keep costs down because they bore no loss on the loans. The increasing amount of student loans needed to pay skyrocketing tuition made them unpayable by an increasing number of borrowers, guaranteeing a loss to the federal government and thus the taxpayer. This program failed from the outset, largely because it imposed no incentive on schools to stop spending. A structural fix seems relatively simple. Have universities responsible for a percentage of the losses and make them approve all loans. That would incentivize them to lower costs. Before COVID, student loans were in the red with some estimates of losses as high as 500 billion. COVID exacerbated the student loan problem by leading the government to defer payments on student loans and stopping the accrual of interest, a giveaway which still continues today. In January 2022, the Wall Street Journal estimated the cost of this moratorium to that date at 100 billion, with an ongoing cost of four to five billion a month until payments and accruals, interest accruals resume. President Biden further worsened the situation by implementing by administrative fiat, a loan forgiveness program of up to 10,000 per student loan borrower and up to 20,000 for those with Pell Grants, subject to income caps. The Congressional Budget Office estimates this would cost an additional $400 billion. But relief of $10,000 per borrower would still leave many loans in default for which the taxpayer would remain on the hook and not come close to causing this problem to break even. President Biden's actions have been challenged in the courts. If his actions are sustained, the student loan taxpayer hole would be well over half a trillion dollars and counting. Once again, no structural reforms were made with this bailout. So even after half a trillion in taxpayer funding, loans will continue to be made under these terms and the loans will get, and the hole will get ever deeper. The parallels between the multi-employer pension plan and the student loan bailout are striking. In both cases, huge amounts of taxpayer money were poured into inherently flawed programs with no attempt at structural reform, thereby guarantee that, guaranteeing that taxpayers in the future will be asked to bail these programs out again. It should be axiomatic that there should never be a bailout without reform, but that seems to be the government's specialty. As 2022 ends, the economy faces war and economic war. 
massive inflation, rising interest rates, a reversal of central bank policies, a diminution in the value of many assets as the air comes out of the everything bubble, and still the COVID crisis, which has not gone away, despite the optimistic pronouncements of politicians, with potential new variants ever lurking in the background. As always, the future is uncertain. The only thing we can say for certain is that we are likely to be surprised again. <laughs> thank, thank you, Howard. Um, I have two things I need to mention before introducing our other discussant tonight. Um, one is that uh, after our discussion this evening, um, that Alex and Howard will be signing books. We've, AEI's acquired a stash of Surprised Again books that are available and for you, and, and uh, Alex and Howard will be signing them. And then for those of you online who want to email in questions, I neglected to mention how you do that. You can email them to Beatrice.Lee at AEI.org, or you can use Twitter, and it's hashtag ask AEI econ. Uh, either, either of those will get your questions to us and I'll be able to read them on this high-tech little device. So joining me in discussing Surprised Again is Christopher DeMuth. Chris DeMuth is a distinguished fellow at the Hudson Institute. He's also the past president of this institution, the American Enterprise Institute, and a former senior serial fellow here at AEI. After Harvard and the University of Chicago Law School, he served as a staff assistant to President Nixon. He also practiced, after that, he practiced regulatory antitrust and general corporate law with Sidley and Austin in Chicago. He was then associate general counsel of Conrail in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. He was a lecturer in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School of Government and director of the Harvard Faculty Project on Regulation. In 1981, Chris returned to government and served in the U.S. Office of Management and Budget and is executive director of the Presidential Task Force on Regulatory Relief during President Reagan's first term in office. He was a managing director of Lexicon, Inc., a law and economics consulting firm, a big one, and publisher and editor-in-chief of Regulation Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Chris DeMuth. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this is a, this is a magnificent book, uh, and it is uh, so uh, deep and varied, and there is so much original analysis uh, combined with lucid writing uh, that it's hard to summarize. I, I, there's just there's just one thing I want to say in summary. Everyone in the room and everybody listening in would have had to pay very careful attention to know that this book was written by two senior officials of the federal government who were in office while all of these events took place. This is an account of the government's handling a major crisis by two of the people who were at the center of crisis management headquarters. And yet there is no, in the whole book, there's no bombast, there's no kiss and tell, there's no settling of scores, there's no bragging about heroism and brave insights that either people accepted or didn't accept. Um, it is a book that is devoted to being instructive. It is centered not on the authors and their magnificent posts at the center of power when a crisis was being handled. Uh, it is intended to educate, illuminate the author the the, uh, the, uh, the readers of the book, <clears throat> and it is in fact filled with references to that reader. They, <clears throat> they point to some chart or some analysis, and they say, well, perceptive reader, what did you think about that? And you'll, you'll, you will encounter the skeptical reader, the thoughtful reader, the excellent reader. That's all you, and it is all intended to draw you in and make you a good student of this amazing tale that they have to tell in a way that is more detached and disinterested uh, than any memoir of government service I've ever seen. Surprised again, 
the people who were surprised were um, not, not just average folks, that's not the focus. The people who were surprised were the central bankers, uh, treasury officials, legislators, and others, financial officials, who are supposed to be responsible for the safety and soundness and stability of our financial system, none of whom saw this coming. Um, they didn't see it coming weeks before it arrived. Uh, and uh, this, this is typical, as the, our authors show us, uh, for uh, government officials to be, to be completely flummoxed by amazing events uh, that nobody else, that, that nobody saw coming. Not just average folks, but the people who were, but the people who were supposed to be protecting us, average folks, uh, from these enormous financial vicissitudes. What I want to press upon our authors is, what lesson do we draw from what the government did next in the midst of these extraordinary times of uh, March through the summer of, uh, of 2000? <clears throat> When I look back at the two uh, <clears throat> previous big financial crises, we got a lot of smaller ones, but the big ones uh, in my lifetime were the SNL crisis in the uh, 1980s <clears throat> and then the financial collapse in 2007 through 2009. I think the lesson of both of those collapses um, for anybody who was paying attention was that they had been caused by government policies themselves. Government policies had sown uh, the seeds of underlying instability, which when the financial worm turned, when asset prices changed, <clears throat> it exposed problems that the government had been creating. I don't think we see that lesson here. Um, COVID was not caused uh, by government uh, policies. Uh, it was not the result of anything that was ill considered, if we simply look at the public health response, <clears throat> we see that things were not anticipated, that were mistakes were made. That is not what this book is about. This book is about the reaction to the panic and eventual lockdowns of the economy, which um, put financial markets and commercial markets into, uh, into free fall. Uh, I'm always looking for ways to blame the government when big problems come along, but I really can't blame uh, the government for the uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic and the public panic, business panics that eventuated. So what I get, I'm going to get to a question here, gentlemen. <laughs> um, so you've given us this extraordinarily detailed and convincing account of what the government is. Okay, stipulate. Big surprise. You too. You were sitting over in the Treasury building. You were surprised. Everybody was surprised. But what did you do next? And what I want to say is, as I read this book, it was a masterful performance um, uh, by the Congress, by the Federal Reserve Board, by the estimable officials of the United States uh, Treasury Department, uh, through the extension of lending and uh, provision of liquidity, enormous amounts of money put into the hands of households. It ended the panic quickly. It stabilized markets. It minimized what would otherwise have been enormous uh, personal uh, hardship. <clears throat> and there was a cost, there was a price, and the price had to be paid uh, for these great uh, exertions. And as of today, uh, the price was uh, two years of 7% inflation uh, and an asset, a series of asset price, asset bubbles and bursts. And when you get these run ups and run downs, and when inflation picks up, uh, a lot of people get hurt. There are costs. People pay those costs. Um, if this program had been designed and advanced at AEI, uh, we would have done it through taxes afterwards and so forth. There still would have been a, a cost. But within 2020 and 2021, it looks to me like, in reading your book, it was a big success. And there were costs afterwards, 
uh, and we're, we're paying those costs now. Uh, but should this tell us that we should be happy with our institutions? And maybe we shouldn't care that much if we're surprised again. If you guys and your Confederates could do so well, uh, uh, regaining your equipoise so quickly, even the Congress got in the game, uh, which did very little to be helpful uh, in 2008, uh, they seem to have been helpful. So is this, is this a, uh, a success story? Well, um, in part it is. What we don't have is a, a crystal ball to know where we would be today in terms of in, inflation and paying the cost if, um, uh, if, if, if the government had followed what um, Alex uh, has written about in his prior books and discussed in this book as the Cincinnatus principle, which is basically getting out of Dodge when the uh, crisis is over. That's, I think, where the government um, failed. Uh, at the end of 2021, in the waning days of the Trump administration, uh, Secretary Mnuchin and Treasury was basically um, looking to put an end to the COVID, um, uh, uh, to the, uh, the massive infusions of liquidity, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Beijat uh, 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 formula for fixing things, and to go back to normal would we have been in better shape than if we had done that? But, but we didn't do that. Instead, in 2021, you had the American um, uh, Rescue Plan, which threw a, a, a $1.9 trillion on top of the problem, um, further, in my view, leading to, uh, leading, to, uh, leading to further inflation, and um, spent a lot of money on things that really had very little to do with COVID, the multi-employer um, pension bailout being only one of them, uh, as, we, as I, we mentioned. But um, I think we got it right, but the problem is we didn't stop soon enough. And that's where I think, I, I want to give you something here. Right. That's where yeah. the government did fail us, I think. I'd like to make a, a few uh, comments in addition. Uh, it's interesting. I think that only a very rich society could have adopted the public health strategy that the rich societies did adopt, which is to close down big parts of the economy. You have to be rich to do that. Uh, a traditional society, people are too busy working to stay alive, couldn't do it. Let us say we are rich, we, we did do it, uh, and then you get this problem uh, of the uh, financial markets, trying to anticipate what that means. And we discuss in the book uh, how in every, in this 2020 panic and in every panic, uh, always in history and always in the future, I'm sure, you get a, uh, a uh, what was called this time a dash to cash or a movement into cash in which balance sheets are trying to compress. And we ask the question, can everybody's balance sheet shrink at the same time? <laughs> Can everybody go into cash at the same time? And the answer is no, unless you're willing to have a, an utter collapse of asset prices. And if you don't want that, then somebody else's balance sheet has to expand. And who is that going to be? Well, in a crisis, it's going to be, and it always is, every time, the government. So Pollock's empirical law of crises is the government always intervenes, for better or for worse, it doesn't matter. Every finance minister and central bank uh, chairman will always intervene in the panic because somebody's balance sheet has to expand so that other people's balance sheet can, can shrink. And then we get to the point Howard brings up, which is, however, that should only be an emergency response. So, uh, and we, let me just f finish the thought, and then when the, when the uh, uh, crisis is over, you have to turn off the emergency response. That did not happen. The Federal Reserve was still buying mortgages in the spring right. of this year. So, still pushing, pushing the bubble up. And, and one uh, uh, final point is, just to, to stress with the point Howard made, if you have a bailout, there should be reform. In 1989, there was substantial reform. May not have been all right, but it was right. reform. With the SNL bailout, 2010, right. same thing. There was a bailout, but there was reform. This time we get bailout basically without reform, 
Uh, and that's uh, what you don't want to do. Yeah, so Thank I'm going to take issue a little bit with the analogy to 2008 and, and this one. So it was a dash to cash in 2008. The markets melted down. Um, the government did respond, uh, TARP, as you remember, and it was much maligned. But in fact, the government made money on TARP in the end. They made on a the profit. Banking, on the banking part of TARP. Yeah, okay, they lost on the auto industry. They that lost was a, on the car auto companies. industry. But overall, <laughs> TARP yeah. was actually profitable. It was. It wasn't a giveaway. This time, they shut down the economy and yeah. they gave away money. They printed money. Yeah, that's so, true. I, you know. Was, was this better than two? First of all, they should have never shut down the economy, and, and, and that, I think, was a disaster. Um, but people felt obliged to, to give away money because they stopped, forced them to stop working. But um, the book doesn't really compare this outcome to the 2008 outcome, but they were, the dash for cash was handled quite differently in both cases, and I'm I'm not sure uh, which was the better one. We gave away a lot. We gave away a lot of free money this time to a lot of things that didn't get reformed. Uh, the politicians did, didn't let a good crisis go to waste. They bailed out, you know, Illinois and 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 pension funds. And when we get back to central uh, bank to the max, um, the Fed played a huge part here, and and the authors. Uh, want to want to relate it to to Badgett's uh, um, dictum on on lending, but but in fact um, the Fed blew it. They didn't really follow ba Badgett. Uh, Badgett was very clear when he said <laughs> the goal of lending is is to stay the panic, and for this purpose there are two rules. First, these loans should be made only at a very high rate of interest. These are his words. These will operate as a heavy fine on unreasonable timidity and will vent the greatest number of applications by persons who do not require it. But the Fed charged, didn't charge a penalty rate. It, it funded, gave away PPP loans. I mean, the, the government gave away PPP loans. Um, the, the Fed was protected for loss. And back in the time of Badgett's time, the Bank of England, the discount window operated for a profit. The Bank of England made a profit on the discount window. And after every crisis, you could see their profits going up because they lent at a high, <laughs> high rate of interest and, and, and freely at a high rate of interest. The second aspect that they kind of blew is the Fed bought long maturity assets. They bought, they bought tr long-term treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And in Badgett's day, you only discounted short-term self-liquidating paper. It, they didn't, wouldn't buy paper longer than 95 days in tenor. So the paper just rolled right off. So you didn't have the centennial problem like, like you mentioned. So, I mean, it was central bank to the max, but you know, maybe they should have read Lombard Street a little more carefully before they, they jumped in there with some of these programs. I mean, You're I think, absolutely right. What was, I think I tried to say it carefully in my remarks tonight, the, uh, the central banks, and it wasn't only the Fed now, it's the central banks all over the world, or all the major central banks. Yeah. I mentioned the six, you know, uh, the, uh, the Fed, uh, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, the National Bank of Switzerland, the Bank of Japan, all did the same thing. Uh, and uh, I suspect a lot of them cited Walter Badgett, but they only cited, I think I said in my remarks, and tried to say it carefully, one part, one part of Badgett, which was lend freely. They remembered the lend freely part. The only on good collateral, only at a high rate, uh, not so much, but that, you know, what is good collateral and what rate do we have to lend that? And when, when the subject seems to be survival, all of those become vaguer, whereas the lend freely is, is clear. Uh, and, but, but your comments uh, about not following the entire budget program are certainly right. Uh, but we should imagine, that we, should, we should realize this was all being done all over the world at the same, at the same time. Uh, and one of the results now of having bought all these long assets, and we don't discuss this in the book because we weren't quite there in history yet, but is that central banks all over the world are now sustaining substantial losses on these portfolios of long a very long-term bonds, and in this country, mortgages, and in some countries, uh, equity securities they bought uh, are now taking uh, uh, very big uh, mark-to-market, maybe unrealized, maybe not on the books, 
uh, but losses, and that's going on all over as well. Let me um, also respond. Um, I, I think you make a very good point. Um, lending on, on good security and high interest rates is a crucial part of Beja's um, uh, program, and these are two things that we didn't do. But there's really a difference um, in kind between 2008 and 2020. In 2008, the crisis which originated in the housing sector um, you had a lot of, um, of, of assets, ha housing assets, banking assets that were very, very quickly um, uh, devalued. They lost liquidity. Their price came way down. There was a, um, a, a good, a, a good um, at least a possibility, as it turned out, that if somebody could, could add liquidity, could lend on those assets for some fixed period of time, the assets would increase in, in value. What happened in 2020 is really something the world hasn't seen since the Black Death, when you really haven't, didn't have any kind of economy to bail out, I suppose. But um, you had people who just couldn't work anymore. They were unable to work, and they couldn't, they, they weren't getting paychecks, and they couldn't live from paycheck to paycheck. So something more had to be done. Some mechanism had to be found to put money into their pockets. I don't think that's a, I think that's a, uh, I think government reacted, um, reacted well to that. The problem is that after the shutdowns ended and things started to return, we continued with this, um, with this payment in, into the system, which, which resulted in um, these inflationary, um, these inflationary uh, 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 trends that we see today. And my, you know, I, I, I'd argue that, um, uh, had we stopped a little bit, it was necessary to get, pe to get people to have money. People uh, couldn't pay their rent, so you had, you had forbearances on, on rent. Uh, people couldn't buy groceries, so you gave them money to put, put in their pockets to buy groceries. But that, those shut down, and, and the, the economy in 2008 was not fully shut down, but, the, but, but that shutdown, something extraordinary was necessary, and they did it. But after those shutdowns, it should have been stopped. That's what I would say. Let me just mention, too, since Howard brought up the Black Death, in, in a paragraph toward the end of the book, we compare the mortality of the COVID pandemic first to the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic and then to the Black Death. And this was much uh, more moderate than those horrific uh, experiences were, but it was certainly bad enough, and it was bad enough to cause the fear which triggered uh, all the other uh, events. Did Sweden, I think famously, didn't shut down and is reputed to have one of the better outcomes of this. Did, there, did they have to bail out? Do you, do, do you guys, does anybody up here know sort of what happened financially and economically in Sweden? And uh, I, I, I don't, uh, you know, they, they didn't uh, shut down their economy. They didn't close businesses. They, people went to school. and. Um, yeah. So their co their COVID experience was not radically better or radically worse than others. Their economic and social experience was radically better. Better. Yeah. So but that's not surprising because it was really um, the shutdown which led to um, all of these Fed Fed uh, programs and, and and the lending rather than the uh, you know than the COVID disease itself. So one one of the long long term costs that that really worries me um, is the corrosive effects that all of these government crisis responses have on our credit culture. Now everybody thinks they deserve a bailout. Everybody thinks they shouldn't pay their rent. Uh, it, there, there should be, you know, you should get tax rebates for, you know, bigger for having kids. They want to bring those back. Um, I mean, there's, there's this whole destructive, in my view, uh, impact it's had. On, on our credit culture. And one of the things that, that made the United States uh, ability to grow and prosper was um, contracts. You could, you could borrow, you could, you, could, you, could get, you could be paid back, or you could foreclose on collateral. And, and now we've become a lot more like Latin America, where you, you never make a mortgage, because if they don't pay the mortgage, you, you can't foreclose on the house for 30 years. Um, we've really, it seems to me, um, accelerated that, uh, that problem in America with, with, with this response. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. I think uh, that's true. One of the classic arguments 
uh, in financial theory uh, over the couple of centuries uh, at least in which it's been debated is that the so-called moral hazard, that when, you, when the central bank and the government uh, creates financing and bailout programs, it convinces people that they ha can be more risky, uh, less careful, less responsible. They don't have to pay their debts, as you say, Paul. Um, and so you shouldn't do it. On the other hand, there is the problem of the moment of surviving when it looks like things are, are collapsing. Uh, and that's where I always tell the story. If, if the central bank governor and the finance minister or the chairman of the Fed and the secretary of the treasury are gazing over a cliff and imagining that the financial system is going to go over the cliff and crash, they will, ba they will do the bailout now and they'll worry about the moral hazard later every time. And so we do have the moral hazard problem is real but it always loses in the immediacy of the crisis. And can you replace it later? Well, maybe, maybe you can if you have the right kinds of reforms. A great example of that uh, is, occurs in the student uh, loan area. I was sort of horrified to read in the, the papers uh, uh, a couple months ago that um, financial advisors were telling their clients who could well afford to repay their student loans don't do it. Don't repay the loan that you owe because you're going to be bailed out. You'll be throwing money away. And that was probably, you know, I don't know if, if, if this, this program will be struck down by the courts or not, but that was probably good financial advice, but it was also sort of horrifying. Yeah, terrible advice. And it, uh, worse than that is then you become a sucker. Oh, you're paying? You're a sucker. You could have gotten off. And those are very bad social uh, trends. I agree. Oh, I'm supposed to say something? Maybe, look, the mere wanna, thought. You can pitch one. <clears throat> I, I, I've got more. But. I'm an att attentive reader. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing that occurred to me in reading this book is one reason the, um, especially the Federal Reserve Board, was so quick to set up all of these special credit reserve things and this, that, and, is that the Federal Reserve Board is now a active day-to-day -day partner with essentially every important financial institution uh, in the market. Every so it, we, Alex said the book says um, finance is political. It's always been the case because politicians have to finance wars and highways, and so they get involved in it. Uh, but but we now have a, much more than at any or any earlier time uh, this this deep penetration uh, into every aspect. Uh, and <clears throat> I've noticed that banks, going to the bank is more and more like going to the DMV. You know, you can't get anything done. You're filling out forms to do some minor thing, <laughs> waiting in line and, and so forth. Uh, and it's, it's almost like the, the whole financial system has been uh, politicized uh, and, uh, and the the political effect is we're taking risk. It's like moral hazard is everywhere. We're taking risk out of every part of life, but we're concentrating it in the government. Um, and the, the, when, 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 I read, when I read the last chapter of this book before the epilogue, I was kind of surprised it wasn't there. When I read the book, what I thought the next surprise is going to be uh, that we have become that the federal government has become such a risky enterprise without our realizing it. Uh, we see this through the constant, the, this very, very high debt. I'm surprised with the debt we had in 2020 that we got through this one as well as we did. 7% inflation, heck, I saw that when I was a kid, no big deal. Um, uh, but the level of debts we have now, you combine that with some financial surprise, a health surprise, military uh, uh, necessities where we need vast amounts of, of, the government itself needs vast amounts of money quickly. That to me, that's, that's the most worrisome next surprise that I see because of this centralization of risk that the government no longer can provide the most important kind of risk pr 
protection that it is supposed to uh, uh, provide. Um, uh, and, uh, and so that, 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 that's, that, that's the thing that, that I worry about. And I don't know if the, you have a, your checkoff list lets me put that in, but, but that would be, my, I, I, I would predict the next surprise is going to be a big serious crisis that we actually can't contend with because of the things that we've done, including the long-term sequelae of what we did in the past, just the past few years. Well, here, here's a question. I think that's a really uh, profoundly important point, Chris. We can see, if you look at relatively recent financial history, by relatively recent, I mean the last 50 years, say, you see pieces of the government which absorbed risk, which couldn't absorb, couldn't stand the risk and failed. For example, the Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation, which was a government deposit guarantor for the savings and loans, which absorbed risk from the savings and loans. And when the saving, whole savings and loan industry collapsed, remembering more, more than a 1,000 formally collapsed and that basically the whole industry on average was insolvent, the government's own deposit insurer was also massively insolvent and collapsed, but was bailed out by the Treasury. Now, uh, with the uh, multi-employer pension funds, the government organization, namely the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, um, which was brilliantly dreamed up as an idea by the United Auto Workers in 1960 or so, as a, as a political idea. Anyway, it was set up to absorb the risk, and it did. But the risk got so big that not only did the pension program uh, become completely insolvent, but the U.S. pension guarantor in its multi-employer program was completely insolvent and then was bailed out. So if the pieces... Clearly, pieces, uh, well, let's think of uh, Social Security Administration as another, uh, another example. So now, if you, if you would want to uh, accelerate that, is there then a case where the whole government itself, the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve, which really, Bert Ely taught me years ago. Bert, hi there. We, Burry Lee taught me years ago, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury really have to be viewed as one thing, the government's financing operation. Can you get to a place where it itself can't handle the risk that it's taken on by becoming, let's say, the biggest savings and loan in the world, which, which it has? I mean, then I think the answer is you get a hyperinflation, which is just a way of defaulting, just a way of the government's defaulting on its obligations uh, in another form. So I have a, I'll throw this one your way. In chapter one, um, you say there's something like 60 or more official financial stability reports <laughs> regularly published. So my, my question is, why? <laughs> what, what's the point? <clears throat> Can an official government financial stability report ever say that the country is on the precipice of a financial crisis without <laughs> causing a financial crisis? <laughs> I want to remind you of something that happened back in 2008. <laughs> IndyMax stock sunk to a new low, raising serious questions about the bank's ability to remain solvent. Then Senator Chuck Schumer expressed these concerns in letters he wrote to the FDIC, the <laughs> Office of Thrift Supervision, the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, and then he made the letters public. Well, <laughs> IndyMac immediately suffered a bank run in which $1.3 billion in deposits were withdrawn in a matter of weeks, and IndyMac failed. Uh, so can, can government officials announce that, hey, hey, we're about to have a financial crisis? No, and that's why these things have a fundamental inherent flaw that the people put in charge of saying, are we about to have a crisis, can't ever say we're about to have a crisis. Now, the same way the Federal Reserve can't say we're about to have a crisis because they fear that saying it will bring on the thing they fear. It's a fundamental uh, uh, contradiction uh, in, in, the, in the whole idea. I think you're, uh, you're absolutely right, and it's why, as uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, 
who was the head of the European finance ministers and then the head of the European Council, uh, said about central banking in a crisis, quote, when it becomes serious, you have to lie. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah. you raise, you, you, Paul, you raise an absolutely excellent point. Um, one of the um, uh, so-called remedies for the problem for the financial crash in 2008 and 2009 was a renewed emphasis on financial stability among not only the United States government, but financial stability agencies that proliferated worldwide. The um, FSOC, which uh, I ran the staff of for, uh, for two years, um, was created by Dodd-Frank as a reaction to the 2007 and 2008 crisis. And, you know, they, they published a really, really good report in looking at every aspect of the economy and trying to assess risk. But you're absolutely right. You have to learn how to read these things because they don't, you can't use exclamation points. I mean, you can't say, wow, is that a, is that a problem? And they don't. They talk about moderate risks and they talk it, it is it is very yes it is it is a very very nuanced thing and you have to be learn how to read these things um, and read between the lines to really un, uh, understand them it's a, it's a bit of an art Dan Semmelsberger these reports Howard is referring to have great graphs and great tab tables but the projections never do what the real world does occasionally which is this yeah, so I, and, and which our drafts do do. <laughs> <laughs> they do. But as, as, I, as I always point out to Alex, the uh, Federal Reserve Board can never predict that a recession is coming because at every FOMC meeting, the staff has to project the, and, and lay out the monetary policy path that keeps us from having a recession. Exactly so right. you can't come in six weeks later and say, oops, we really missed that one. <laughs> no, we've got to wait for the data to come in for another you know, nine. We won't know for nine or 10 months unless that we had a recession. You know? So it's, uh, it, yeah, it is quite. Uh, and, and, and getting back <laughs> to what, uh, what, um, what Chris said about, about the government and the Fed, and what we say in the book, that um, uh, all finance is political. I mean, uh, if you read in the New York Times, they, they might tell you that the Fed is not a political agency because it stands apart, blah, blah, blah. But I, I would put it to you that any agency whose heads, the Board of Governors, get appointed by a political official is by its very definition a political ag agency. And they are an intensely political agency regardless of what, what you might read and what they might say. So I, I think it's about time, since we need to leave time to side books, and Chris, you leave you. Um, but we're going to take some questions from the audience. Um, and uh, I have some online here, too. So uh, wait, maybe you could say who you are and uh, wait for the mic. So we've got Bert, Bert in the back there, Bert Ely of Ely, Bert Ely and Company. Uh, thank you, and my apologies for being late, but a uh, very interesting discussion. Um, a, a comment and, and then a question. My recollection is that in the aftermath of the SNL crisis, maybe somewhere around 2010, there was a le legislation that supposedly reformed uh, the, the uh, Federal Credit uh, Act uh, to try and have a better pricing, if you will, of the credit risk. Uh, uh, that the government undertakes in these various programs. Be interested in any comments uh, uh, you might uh, have about that. But you know, in a more basic sense, uh, how realistic is it, from a political, practical standpoint, to um, expect the government or any government to do a better job of pricing the credit risks that it takes on in for such things, <coughs> for example, as a student loan program, <coughs> pardon me, or is the reality that government's just never going to do a very good job of that. And therefore, the extent there's any kind of solution at all, it's to keep as much credit risk as possible in the private sector. I learned from Chris DeMuth that the, the thing that always is done wrong by governments and they never do well at is pricing of any kind and setting and regulating prices. And that certainly applies to the price of credit risk. Uh, so yes, I think you ask, is it unrealistic? I think was the way you put the question. Yes, it's unrealistic. So something can be done about it. Well, what's done about it is you don't have the government in charge of prices, if you can help it. You 
will excuse me, Alex, if this is not quite a question, but <laughs> the extension, how can you ensure that your book is extended, not just to those who are making financial decisions, but those who are making epidemiological decisions? And if I might briefly give you a little background here, <laughs> Professor Neil Ferguson of Imperial College, Oxford, was the one who used his models to and said that COVID would lead to 2.2 million deaths in the US and 500,000 in the UK. Given as he is to hubris, he made sure, and he's a good operator from that point of view, he made sure that that was published in the New York Times in March and the same figures for the UK were published at the same time. But it put politicians in a difficult position, but if they had checked his record, they would have found that every single prediction that he made, which unfortunately were acted upon in the case of foot and mouth disease since the year 2000, were faulty. <laughs> None of those predictions proved anything near the truth. <laughs> and with COVID deaths, of course, we do have to remember the distinction between from and with. But I won't go into that any further. My argument in an article I wrote in the Times that epidemiologists' models should be given the same treatment as Basel gave banking models <laughs> after the collapse of the financial, uh, after 2008. So please make sure that your book is required reason, get it into their heads, <laughs> that uncertainty is the order of the day. <laughs> Thank you, Una. One over here, please. Bonnie Wachtel. I'm in the securities industry and a longtime follower and admirer of several of those of you on the stage. Uh, you know, my head is going in exactly the same direction, I think, as the comment we just heard. When we study, in hindsight, what was done from the health establishment of government, it certainly makes the Treasury and the, and the Fed look like a bunch of philosopher kings. And putting this into AEI speak, there was a panel on this just a few days ago, because apparently the flag is up now that it's all right to criticize and review the CDC and what was done. And I might add, Paul's comment about Sweden really encapsulates everything about what was done incorrectly in the United States. So the one thing everyone agreed on on the panel, which was Democrats and Republicans, both sides of the aisle, was, you know, we really need some economists to get into these decisions so we can have some cost-benefit analysis because they all agreed we had absolutely none. And that assumes that the science was correct in the first place with respect to the epidemiology, so the, which it wasn't, I hear behind me. So getting to, getting to the question for Alex and Howard, now that we learn that your absence from AEI for a while is because you were striding the corridors of power, is it possible for the Treasury for someone to get into that conversation in the future, because we could have another, you know, another pandemic next week to be saying, look, we really can't afford to do this again the way you did it last time. So let us provide some economists for you so that we can possibly get it right. That's all, of course, after you've stemmed the panic, which was done admirably in, in six weeks. And, you know, there are a lot of, uh, it's not just the inflation. We also have permanently changed the labor market and the way people vote, which is very, which is kind of distressing. And if you don't want to answer that question, I'll throw in another one, which is, so how much confidence on the basis of all of this background you have in the Fed's reaction to continuing the fight against inflation 
uh, to the extent of actually winning that battle. Thank you. <laughs> I, Bonnie, I, I would say we don't want to be too <coughs> confident in the ability of economists to know what to do either, but it obviously makes sense in such discussions as you talk about to have uh, both trying to understand the financial and economic consequences of what one was doing. You would think that was, uh, that was basic uh, with any action uh, as well uh, as, the, as the health uh, effects, uh, just like you would want to understand the national security and uh, effects of different programs. But just don't overestimate the ability of economists to know what they're doing <laughs> either. I used to, when I was in, at AEI, which I enjoyed greatly, I used to have this, this joke with my colleagues who were economists, because I'm not an economist, I'm a financial type, and I, my joke was the difference between economists, between economics, and finance is that, that in finance we actually know some things. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot of confidence in cost-benefit analysis either, <laughs> but, but your point is well taken and, and it, um, the government seemed to really get out of control uh, and then uh, the Treasury and the Fed were willing to fund that for some, you know, without didn't seem like there was a lot of discussion back and forth. So what's all this going to cost us? Um, so we have a question online. You have a question out here, Paul. OK. Um, then we'll go to the online question after that. Then. I see in your index that you don't list climate change as searchable. So I'm wondering, with the 2007 collapse, some triggered by the $4 gas for the climate change tend to force consumer change. How are you dealing with the left wants to lock out supply and demand and old energy and maintain a floor for green to be affordable? How do you address that for COVID, where you have the political economy forces like blocking out supply and demand and market forces? All finance is political. You see it, in, you see it absolutely clearly in the, in the issues you raise. You know, I mean, address your point and also to Bonnie's excellent point. I'm afraid, um, we go back to um, Pascal. Basically, we, we live in a universe where it is very hard to hold on to anything that is firm. Um, we live in quicksand. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a morass. The <laughs> science of COVID was, it turns out, was very flawed. They didn't know what they were talking about. They still don't know what they were talking about. The economics of COVID, also flawed. Um, uh, nothing, no real, I mean, follow the science. If only we could. I mean, if there were only some real, some facts, some, some certainty that we could hang on to and that we could, we could um, base our future actions on. But you don't find that in the medical science of COVID. You certainly don't find that in the economic science. The largest um, employer of economics PhDs in the country is, of course, the Federal Reserve. They have hundreds of brilliant economists, and yet we are in the inflationary mess that we are, are now in, in today. So um, I, I wish, and, and climate change is another, another thing. If only I knew the truth about climate change. How bad is it? Which science is, is which science is correct? How much of it is political? How much of it is isn't? And I, I read and I, I try, like to think I'm a, a reasonably bright person, and I try to think about it. But I'm I'm I'm, I'm left completely confused. And um, to some people, uh, uh, to some people on the right, climate change is a word that you should should never mention at all, and is uh, is uh, is is anathema, and that's probably wrong. To some people on the left, climate change is a religion, and that is almost certainly wrong. So I don't really know, I don't really know what to say to either of you, except that um, the only thing we do have, even if it is in medical science or economics, is common sense, and we should all try to exercise as much of that as we possibly can. It seems like we lost our common sense <laughs> this last crisis to me. I have one question, for, and then we're going to, I think, need to go to book signing, so you gentlemen have time to, to sign the book. This is from Jane Johnson uh, online. 
That's a long question. I might shorten it a little bit. It seems that fear at all levels, from the most personal to the national, paralyzed everyone from dealing rationally and clearly with events as they unfolded. I've never been a fan of FDR, but I keep waiting during the recent virus era for some politician uh, to uh, basically take the FDR moment and say all we have to fear is fear itself. Would something like this have injected some rationality and common sense in the government's actions during those fraught times? Uh, or I guess another way, were, did the government prey on the fears of people in some way to pass some of these very expensive bills with bailouts for unions and Illinois and New York City uh, Transit Authority and other things uh, that normally wouldn't pass. I added that at the end. Well, you know. Um, I'll have a comment after, good. After, uh, after Howard. All I can say is to go back to what Alex said from the podium, which is that you forget how scared we were. We were all <clears throat> petrified. Asset prices were plummeting. The economy was shut down. There was a lot of, of fear. Um, the government didn't have to uh, create that fear. I think the, uh, the, the fear was wrong, and, 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 they, and they, you know, they, we, I guess, did our best to try to respond to that fear at the time. And uh, I think uh, that, you know, uh, I'll say all the things we didn't say in the book and that uh, we were commended for not saying, I think we did a pretty good job in 2019 of, on, on the short term of, 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 of preventing uh, a total catastrophe. And I, I hope that we, uh, that, that, that the government hasn't created um, the, uh, the seeds of, a, of what may be uh, just as big a catastrophe uh, going forward. I, let me say uh, thanks for that question, Jane. Uh, the problem is that there really is a lot to fear in the world. There was in the 1930s, to be sure, and there is now. Uh, one of the tactics that central banks and governments almost invariably use as a financial crisis is developing is to assure everybody that really everything is okay. Uh, but it doesn't work if you're really going down. And there, there is this hope it comes a little bit back to the problem of what do you say if you're the Financial Stability Oversight Council or the Central Bank or the Secretary of the Treasury? Can you speak the truth about how bad it is when you're still not sure uh, that it might be that bad? Uh, and so it's very common for them to have all kinds of, uh, of uh, assurances, <clears throat> really no problem. Remember, the subprime problem is contained as, as an infamous uh, example of it. Uh, well, this inflation is transitory is another. These are uh, attempts to do that, but uh, if the problems uh, are, are really there, then it won't work. Well, please. Um, the, the, uh, the Pollock Adler report on the economy, when, it, when they write it, and, uh, the financial situation, it's gonna be, there's a lot of risk out there that we can't do anything about, so everybody better be really, really careful. It'd be the opposite of the current ones. In, in response to this question, <laughs> let me say that I, <clears throat> I don't think my, uh, my understanding of the situation, both the financial side and the public health side, is not that there was a lot of deliberate fear-mongering, as, as she um, fears there might have been, but I thought, I think that once things got going, people uh, uh, took advantage of the situation. I think the 2021 legislation versus the 2020 legislation is a very good example of that. There were you know, good and bad parts to the 2020 legislation, but the second one was just all pork being justified. Uh, and there was a certain amount of fear, you know, that we're still this, uh, we're still in the middle of this. The uh, President Biden's student loan action was justified because we still are dealing with the aftershocks of the COVID. You know, so it's being used to justify a lot of things. <clears throat> the um, the initial shutdowns of schools, retailing, offices, and so forth um, that was not 
done by the CDC or anybody in Washington. These were local decisions, and they were taken in March. It was actually in the middle of March. There hadn't been any shutdowns. And, and in Washington, it was 15 days to flatten the curve, and then it was another 30 days to flatten the curve. There were no shutdowns there. And there was a little footnote about we should pay careful attention to schools, nothing about masks. It was social distancing and a lot of things like cleaning surfaces that we didn't, it turned out it wasn't important, but you know they were just getting to know it. The first shutdown came in um, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, and it was by people who were public health people, but they were county officials. And it was, I think, the 14th of March, and they were in a situation of, pan there was panic everywhere. And what they knew as public health officials was that there was this virus that was spreading in the Northeast, around Seattle, and around San Francisco. They didn't know anything about it. They didn't know how it was spreading. They didn't know who had it. They couldn't find out who had it because they couldn't get the testing apparatus approved from Washington. The second thing they knew was that by in very large numbers, people were dying in gurneys in hospital uh, corridors in Italy, where you know it was a, that was that's where we're going to be in a few weeks. So they just shut down everything. And some of these people have written about this. The knowledge they had is the knowledge that I have just said. That, that's all they knew. <clears throat> but they had the local police powers to shut things down. In two weeks. It had gone all California, New York, the mayor and the governor were arguing who was in charge. But by the end of, uh, by April, it had essentially gone nationwide. But then I think the public health authorities, both national and local, when they saw we can actually do these things, I mean, it, suddenly there was an enormous amount of day-to-day -day power that governors and mayors had. And I think that one saw from that point going on a lot of abuses uh, when people realized that they had the ability to do things and maintaining the fear was really important. And if you're going to say it's illegal <laughs> to play golf, you know, you've got to really exaggerate any, there's no knowledge that would tell you that. The, the, the knowledge we had, we should have said, go, if you don't know how to play golf, learn how to play golf, go out and play golf. Um, but People wanted to shut down everything, and so a lot of politics insinuated itself uh, into it. Um, and it, it, was, it was not a happy story, but it was not the story some people like to tell that the government saw this problem and came in and scared people. Because the, at, at the beginning, it was people themselves who were scared, and the government was, I think, being, being responsive to those uh, fears. Uh, but then an enormous amount of power, as Alex said, it couldn't have done this in 1919. Um, and suddenly we, the people in government realized that they had an enormous amount of latitude and that became dangerous. I've gone on a little too long, but I, I, think, I think she makes a very good point, but it's a, it's a pretty nuanced story, I think both in finance and public health, where a lot of things started out okay uh, but then there was a pretty rapid uh, corruption that seeped in. I, th I think it's certainly true. People were very frightened, first for their life and then for their money, or both. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but if I could go back to the first part of your comments, Chris, I think it's absolutely right to contrast the 2020 bailout legislation with the 2021. And there you see, I think, uh, I agree, a perfect example of the violation of what I call the Cincinnatian doctrine, which is that you, you have the intervention in the crisis, and when the crisis is over, you stop. And that's a perfect example of where the, that was not done. And then the cost of the, uh, of the intervention became much greater with the second set of interventions when, in fact, the crisis was already over. So I want to say this is really a very interesting book. Um, it's very well done. Uh, and as, I, as I mentioned to Alex, I called him a couple days ago, and I said, Alex, I just finished your book for the second time. I said, it's really well written, but it's really depressing. <laughs> 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 the pension funds are 
have to be bailed over and over and the and the board, it, it just but it's but it's but it's written in a, it's very easy to read it it's very well done I, I highly recommend it to you and I and I really thank you guys for a great discussion and I want to let you go sign some books for your for your fans out here Chris thank you very much this was wonderful thank you very much Paul and Chris thank you